Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for um, your flexibility with a change of time just today. We'll go back to our regular time next week at 11 o'clock, but if you're watching this, uh, if you're watching the recording, then this this discussion makes no sense to you because you're watching at your own at your own leisure. So our um, uh, portion this week is Emor, and a shout out to Paul Tillis who's on Zoom because it's the anniversary of his bar mitzvah this week, and he announced it at Minyan. So I'm not giving away any secrets. It's the 55th anniversary of his bar mitzvah. So you do the math to figure out how old he is. And um, happy anniversary, Paul. So <clears throat> the portion Emor is in the Eitz Chaim on page 717, 717, or whatever edition of Chumash you have, you're looking for Leviticus chapter 21. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, shekitshanu v'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok v'divrei Torah. So um, th this week's portion focuses mainly on the Kohanim themselves, and then uh, also on the holidays, the sacred occasions to be celebrated throughout the year. So the, the, the first two chapters of this, uh, of this portion, chapters 21 and, and most of chapter 22, is really on behaviors, uh, ritual behaviors, um, spiritual behaviors that are expected of the Kohani. And I wanted to, uh, to talk about that for a little bit, uh, to just in general about these behaviors that set the Kohanim apart from uh, other Israelites. Okay, so if we just understand that the Torah knows of 12 tribes of Israel, of the 12 tribes is the tribe of Levi, okay? So the tribe of Levi is set apart from all the other tribes. They were chosen by God, doesn't say why, what makes Levi more important than Judah or, or not more important, just designated for this task. Why them and not Yisachar or Asher or Reuben? any of the other 11 uh, tribes. So that we don't know, it's just that God has already chosen the tribe of Levi. And then, so that's Moses, Aaron and Miriam are from the tribe of Levi. And then uh, why Moses's brother Aaron is designated to, to start a new subset within the tribe of Levi known as the Kohanim. Okay, so Jews today are descended from two tribes. That's all that's left. The tribe of Judah. So a regular Israelite, a regular Jew is from the tribe of Judah. So if somebody converts to Judaism, they're converting into the tribe of Judah. And then if anybody is a Levi or a Kohen, then they are descended from the tribe of Levi. Okay, so those are the two tribes left after the other 10 tribes were um, exiled by the Assyrian Empire in around 700, 800 BCE. And those 10 tribes are lost forever. And they, they were forced to assimilate into the Assyrian Empire, as opposed to 200 years later with the Babylonian exile that the Jews the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Judah were allowed to maintain their separate Jewish identity. Okay, and it's thanks to the Babylonians that we're still alive today as Jews. Okay, so the tribe of Levi designated by God and among the tribe of Levi, the Kohanim, Aaron and his, and his descendants are make up the subset of the tribe of Levi known as the Kohanim. Now we're told here, beginning with 717, by Yomer Adonai El Moshe, God said to Moses, Emor el Kohanim, speak or tell the Kohanim, 
B'nei Aharon, the sons of Aaron, and uh, alehem, and say to them, Lenefesh lo yitama be'amav. None shall defile himself for any person among his kin. Okay, so dead is put there in brackets because uh, from the context, it's talking about uh, con the, 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 um, the prohibition of coming into contact with the dead. Uh, it's only, verse 2, ki im li she'ero, except for the relatives that hakarove love that are closest to him. Le'imo ula'aviv, ve'livno ula'vito ula'achiv. For his mother, for his father, for his son, for his daughter, for his brother. Ula achoto habetula hakrova elav, and for his unmarried, that's how I'm going to translate it, unmarried sister close to him, asher lo hayetala ish la yitama. And uh, for her, he can if she's not married. Okay, so he can, he can uh, impurify himself for father, mother, unmarried sister, brother, and child. But he shall not defile himself as a kinsman by marriage and so profane himself. Uh, and then other, uh, other things here about their behavior, they shall not shave smooth any part of their heads or cut the side growth of their beards or make gashes in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God for they offer the Lord's gifts, the food of their God, and so must be holy. They shall not marry a woman defiled by harlotry, nor shall they marry one divorced from her husband, for they are holy to their God, and you must treat them as holy. Since they offer the food of your God, they shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. So there are restrictions on who the Kohen can marry, and on whom, uh, on whom they can impurify themselves in case a relative, in case someone dies, that uh, then uh, sets them apart from the average Israelite. So this, uh, I wanna just pause here and just reflect on this because we, we know that Catholic priests are set aside from everyone else who is Catholic. Right, so there's behavior expected of a Catholic priest. What 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 is happening in the real world today on Catholic priests is a discussion for another time. But Catholic priests are set aside from the rest of the Catholic community by going to Catholic seminary, studying for the priesthood, taking a vow. Then a Catholic priest then uh, confirms that they are different from everybody else and that they are the direct line from God and Jesus to the Catholic community. And there, thereby, they are not allowed to be married, to show that they are set aside from everybody, everybody else in the Catholic community. Now, knowing this, we know that in Judaism today, that is not the case for rabbis. Anybody, as long as you uh, are accepted to rabbinical school, any Jew can go to rabbinical school. And there's no vow that my father took or I took that sets us aside from anybody else in the Jewish community. When we have when we achieved, our, when we reached our um, level of study sufficient to graduate rabbinical school and receive ordination, our ordination certificate says that we now have the knowledge to be able to teach Torah and also to, um, uh, um, uh, to uh, I'm trying to think of the English terminology for this, to decide Jewish law for others in the Jewish community, okay? So it's only because of our knowledge level that we're able to do that. 
But anybody, if they so desire and have the academic chops for it, can become a rabbi. Okay, and there's nothing that that my father and I were expected to do that would make us different than anybody else. Okay, it's just every every Jew is expected to follow the 613 commandments. Now, rabbis, of course, are expected to do that and be role models, but to the community, but it doesn't, but that's but that's not because that we have we have answered a calling or because we have fulfilled a vow, or that we are designated as separate. There isn't like a rabbinic subset of the Jewish community that we were born into this subset. Anybody can do this, and there's just an expected level of knowledge that we're supposed to share with the rest of the Jewish community, okay? Where there are no restrictions on our behavior, or no extra behaviors that we have that nobody else has. We, we marry, we, we can um, impurify ourselves through uh, contact with the dead, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing that, there's nothing that makes us different, okay? So, this, so reading this, it just raises these issues for us. Why would the Kohen be different and how is it now that we don't have this category anymore of people who are set aside like this with their behavior? Now, that's a, there's another thing here. Uh, it, within, within the Catholic community, there are monasteries and convents, right? So there are those priests who decide to stay in the monastery, and there are those women who study to be a nun, uh, there's no such thing in the Jewish community, right? There's no place to go. If uh, there are retreat places, you can go for a weekend or a week or a month that are, but it's nothing like this, right? There, there are more spiritual kinds of things that different segments of the Jewish community run for study, for spirituality, whatnot but it's nowhere near what the Catholic community has um, for monasteries or convents. So all of this is just very different for us. And it's, it's not part of our Jewish mindset. Judaism is for all Jews. We all, and the only, the only um, remnant that we have of this today is that we have people who are born into being a Levi or a Kohen. Right, and in our congregation, we maintain, and not all conservative synagogues do this. All Orthodox synagogues do. Some conservative synagogues do maintain Kohen and Levi Aliyot, so that on our screen here, Barbara is often called up as a Levi for the Levi Aliyah, uh, because we make that egalitarian. Any any man or woman who is a Kohen or a Levi can receive the Kohen and Levi Aliyah. And we also maintain one of the few conservative congregations we retain the, the blessing of the Kohanim on the holidays, right? So, but again, it's not, it's not that they're necessarily any more special than us in this regard without the temple in Jerusalem. It's just that they're born, it's just the luck of being born into that tribe that they're um, able uh, to do that. Um, so um, here though, while the, for the Mishkan, the portable sanctuary, and later for the temple in Jerusalem, because there's a, a full-blown worship service that is expected to be conducted, that the Kohanim then have to, just as the animal that is being offered is pure and unblemished, so to the, the men doing the work need to be pure and unblemished too. So that these, um, these idea who they marry helps maintain the fact that they are unblemished, um, what they, how they handle their bodies, uh, both in terms of shaving or not shaving and how they're coming into contact or not 
with impurity also enables them to maintain a higher standard of, of conduct. But also what we, what, we, um, what we also have here, which is another question which I wanted to bring up, is at the start of the second Aaliyah on 719, verse 16 there. So chapter 21, verse 16, the start of the second Aaliyah, is, is, is this also problematic element here about the Kohen and their physical stature? <clears throat> God spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron saying, a man from your descendants, Lidoratam forever. So for, from your descendants into the future, Asher Yihievomum, who might have on him a blemish, or uh, it says here a defect. Lo Yikrav Lahakriv Lechem Elohav. He should not come close to offer the bread of God. So it says here the food of his God, to offer the bread of his God. He, anyone with a defect is not allowed to offer. He call ish asher bo mum, because every man who has a blemish, who has a defect, lo yikrav, should not come close. And here are some examples. Ish iver, a blind man, or piseach, a, um, a, um, a who uh, is lame, O harum, or has a, a, a limb that is too short, O sarua, or too long, right? So if you're, right? So those are the, and there are more. O ish asher yevo shever regel, someone who has a broken leg, O shever yad, or a broken arm. O gibain, or is hunchback, O dak, or a dwarf. O tevalul be'eno, or has a growth in his eye. O garav, or who has a boil scar. O yalefet, or scurvy. O meroach ashech, or crushed testes. Kol ish asher bomum, uh, all, any man who has this physical defect. Mizera aharon ha'kohen, from the descendants of Aaron, uh, the priest. Lo yigash should not approach lahakriv eti sheyad and I to offer the fires of God eti um, mumbo um, because there's a defect in him. O et lechem elohav or the bread or the food for God. Lo yigash lahakriv he should not come close. Okay, so there are phys there are certain behaviors that Kohen has to do to remain pure. And now we're learning there are physical attributes that the uh, Kohen must have, or he should not have these in order to serve as, uh, as a Kohen. So this also, in the you know, post-temple, when synagogue is accessible to all, when there isn't a Kohen officiating with the sacrificial service, but where everyone is praying the prayers of the service, the idea that someone with a physical defect would not be included in being able to participate in the service seems unwelcoming to say the least, if not a turnoff and maybe the person feel that they have no place in the community at all. So this is, uh, certainly important today, again, in post-temple rabbinic Judaism that we are, the idea that anybody with a physical defect is cannot come close to God is really uh, unnerving and unsettling to, to read. And in fact, we do everything we can to try to um, make people, uh, all, all people, feel comfortable in our building. So, we just installed last year those handicapped accessible buttons to allow uh, people uh, in who, who are uh, in wheelchairs to be able to open a door uh, easily. Uh, so we have that on most of the doors of the first level. We have the, the BIMA that is accessible. You know, so we have two stairs and we have the ramps 
so that people can make it onto the bima as easily as possible. We make the Torah accessible when we can to ensure that everybody who is approaching the Torah can come to the Torah. And in fact, there are even ways in which people with um, uh, otherwise who might find it difficult to participate if not leave the service can do so as well. We, um, um, we had a, a conversation a couple of years ago. There's, there's a woman in the, in the Washington Jewish community um, whose, um, whose daughter is blind. And uh, her daughter became bat mitzvah in a uh, modern Orthodox synagogue in, in the district. And she, the, the mother, who became a, a, an Orthodox rabbi in one of those rabbinic institutions that ordain women rabbis, um, studied and, and wrote a paper in which it's clear that blind people can read from the Torah and also lead a service. So these are questions for another time about how we can do that, but it just shows the, um, how um, progressive our Jewish community uh, is becoming to ensure that everybody in the community, no matter um, their ability, uh, their physical ability, can participate to the fullest in the community itself. And that, that, that and, and it's unfortunate that it's all only in the recent decades that this is the case, right? You, you imagine, you take a look at the old synagogues, you know, synagogues built in the 1950s. So if you, if you think of those uh, of that are still around in the Washington area, right? If you go down 16th Street, just as you enter into the district from Maryland, you have two synagogues on either side um, uh, to Ferret Israel, if you're heading south on 16th Street, to Ferret Israel on the left, um, Oav Shalom on the right, Oav Shalom being the Orthodox, to Ferret Israel conservative. Take a look at the, at the front of their buildings. Lots of steps leading up to the synagogue to get into the synagogue. Now, you can understand spiritually why that would be, okay? There's something about uh, going up to God. But if you think about it, what about someone with a cane? What about someone in a wheelchair? How do they get into the synagogue? Right now, there are other entrances to those synagogues, and those synagogues have done work to retrofit their buildings to ensure uh, access for everyone. But imagine the thought of the architect and the design committee of those synagogues back in the 50s. Addis Israel is like this as well. If you look at Addis Israel uh, from the front, if you're looking at it, from Connecticut, looking at the building, they also have lots of steps leading up to their building. And, and we can all think of buildings like this across America that were uh, of synagogues built in the 50s that have lots of steps leading up. And just think about Philadelphia and the art museum, right? And if you haven't ever been there, but you've seen the Rocky movies and Rocky running up those steps, that's the way, I mean, there are other ways to get into the art museum, but the idea that you go up steps to get into this temple. So the art museum, the temple of culture, uh, or a synagogue, the temple of religion, going up step, steps to get closer to God. I mean, it's, it's the message there, but then the subtle message or not so subtle message to someone in a wheelchair or walking with a cane, huh, this isn't for me. I'm not welcome here. So, and like I said, it's it the, the work of the uh, of the of the disability community and those advocating for people with disabilities has been long and hard, and it's still, you know, why why is it taken so long for uh, why why can why are there only two deaf actors who have received Academy Awards, right? Mary Matlin uh, back in the '80s. And uh, I don't even remember his name, but from the movie Coda, who just won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor uh, just uh, a couple of months ago. Only two, only two actors who are deaf, right? So it's, and, and in advertising, uh, you know, commercials and, and, uh, 
and print media advertising. It's rare to see um, uh, the people depicted in the pictures or in the ads who are in a wheelchair, who are walking with a cane, who don't look uh, pretty or handsome in whatever subjective view um, uh, um, pretty or handsome is, right? So it's, it's just a problem with our society and society around the world in general about the place of, there is a, an image that we have of a person to be. And if we don't live up to that image, we're, ma we're made to feel different and it impacts our confidence and, and self-esteem. So here, it could be understood from our portion and more from 21, chapter 21, verses 16 to 22, that, uh, that God is restricting access to all people with physical defects. Uh, but it's, it's restricted just within the Kohanim. So in other words, it's only a Kohen who wants to serve who has a physical def defect that cannot. It's clear that a person with a physical defect or an average Israelite who wants to bring the Passover offering, for example, or a well-being offering or a Thanksgiving offering, doesn't say anything about that anywhere in the book of Leviticus that you have to meet a certain physical standard in order to do that. So it's just... Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight those couple of things. I also now um, want to turn ahead to the discussion of holidays and, and focus on, um, on the counting of the Omer, since we're in the Omer period right now. Today is the 20, we're halfway through. Today is the 25th day of, of the Omer, uh, with the 50th day being the holiday of Shavuot. So let's take a look at page 726. And if you don't have the Eitz Chaim, we're at chapter 23, beginning with verse 15. 23:15, or page 726, verse 15 in the Eitz Chaim. So here we have the, this law about counting. Usafartem lachem. You shall, you shall count from yourselves. Uh, right, it doesn't say anything here about counting in the English translation. So uh, we'll, we'll take a look at this. So, you shall count for yourselves, mimacharat Shabbat, And I'm going to translate literally, from the day after the Shabbat, miyom haviachem, from the day that you bring, at omer hatenufa, the omer of wave offering, sheva shabbatot temimot tihiena, seven seven full Shabbases they shall be. So you shall count from the day after Shabbat, from the day after you bring the Omer of wave offering, seven Shabbases, seven complete Shabbases they shall be. Now we can translate Shabbases there as weeks because Shabbat could be understood as a week but I just want to translate it literally to help us understand how difficult, how ambiguous this is. So now, verse 16, Ad mimacharat ha-shabbat ha until the day after the seventh Shabbat, tisperu chamishim yom, you shall count 50 days, vihi kravtem mincha chadasha ladunai. Then you shall bring a, a new uh, offering or a new grain offering to God, okay? Uh, and then it, 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 what, what are these offerings that we're bringing? This is the, the count here. Uh, what this is, uh, this, uh, the next few verses talk about that. Um, okay, so now, from, this, from these two cryptic verses, we get the understanding of counting the Omer today between Passover and Shavuot. And the way we count this today is not from the day after Shabbat. It seems pretty clear from the, um, from the verse here that it is the day after Shabbat. And we would say 
the day after Shabbat, after Passover, because the verses before were talking about Passover. So this could either be the day after Shabbat, after the first day of Passover, or it could be the day after Shabbat, after the end of Passover. But the rabbi said no. Now, it's, this is a the rabbinic practice today combines this agricultural remnant of bringing a bushel or an omer, whatever amount an omer is. I'm going to say a bushel, a bushel of new wheat to the temple as a wave offering to in gratitude to God for the, for the harvest, for the new spring harvest. Okay, so it makes sense if we're offering sacrifices that we're offering a sacrifice in gratitude to God for the harvest. Okay, because that's what the holiday of Sukkot is about for the fall harvest. So here, here's the spring harvest um, ceremony. Okay, now, the rabbis, and so, and the rabbis describe in the Mishnah how this uh, wave offering was done and the uh, pageantry that was done around it. So now they do, they do two things with this. First, they say that this happened on the 16th day of Nisan, which is the day after the first day of Passover, right? On the 14th of Nisan during the day, where the Passover sacrifice would be offered all afternoon in the temple. Then that night, the 15th of Nisan is the Seder and the first day of Passover. The next day, the 16th of Nisan would be the day in which this Omer would be brought. So the rabbis do this. They, they say the day after Shabbat is the day after Yantav. Because Yantiv, the first day of the of, of Passover, is like Shabbat. So that's why they, they interpret this word Shabbat here uniquely here to understand the first day of Passover. So they say that the bringing of the Omer happens on the day after the first day of Passover, which is the 16th of Nisan. So that's when this Omer was brought. Now, the rabbis also do something else. The counting of the 50 days, they connect to the holiday of Shavuot because that's the next, that's the next holiday here. And also historically, we know back from the book of Exodus in chapter 19, that they came, the Israelites came after leaving Egypt in the third month to Mount Sinai. So the rabbis counted then 50 days from the Seder, from the Exodus itself, to Mount Sinai in the third month. So that would make it the sixth day of the third month. So the rabbis then wanted to consolidate the, um, to consolidate both the agricultural observance of Shavuot and the bringing of the Omer with the historical events that are of the exodus of Egypt from Egypt and reaching Mount Sinai and hearing the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. So in order to make those 50 days work to connect Passover and Shavuot and to then um, um, fit with the commandment here to count these 50 days from the day after Shabbat, they insisted that it had to be the day after the first day of Passover. Okay, so there are a lot of hoops that the rabbis had to jump through in order to make these words make sense today. Now, it's interesting that the Ethiopian Jewish community which did not have any contact with the rabbinic community in the land of Israel, counts the Omer from Shabbat after the first day of Passover. So they, and so therefore their observance of Shavuot 
is a few days later than our observance, than the rest of the Jewish community's observance of Shavuot. So that's just as part of the Ethiopian Jewish practice because they never encountered rabbinic Judaism that they have a slightly different understanding of how to count. And I can't speak to the Karaite Jews and how they observe Shavuot either, but I'm sure that this wording here impacts how they count the 50 days. Okay, so I, that's what I wanted to say about, uh, about the Omer and counting the Omer. So any questions or comments about, uh, about uh, what we've uh, looked at so far? So um, that's um, it's really all that I wanted to focus on in the Torah portion today. Um, so um, why don't we um, stop here for today in our study of Emor and uh, we will meet again next Wednesday back at the regular time at 11 o'clock next Wednesday. Um, when we uh, look at the portion Bihar next, uh, next Wednesday. So have a good rest of the day, everybody, and, um, and be, stay well.